So today, we're going back to basics to talk about ultra endurance nutrition with the co-host of this show and the coach that got me into coaching, Mr. Adam Pulford. Adam Pulford is a pro-level coach with CTS, a level one coach with USA Cycling, a level one coach with USA Triathlon, and a certified strength and conditioning specialist with the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Say that five times fast. He's been coaching for over 15 years and has been the team director and coach for both professional mountain bike and for road cycling teams, and is now the co-host of this podcast, the Trainwright Podcast. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Corinne. Um, For those of you who don't know Adam, um, I've known Adam for a very, very long time. Um, I think you've been a character reference for me more than once at this point. Perhaps, and that, that makes me feel good to to, to hear that <laughs> character reference for sure. So. Okay, so as I mentioned to you before we hit the record button, races are back. I've got athletes doing B races, tuning up for big A events later this summer and fall. Everyone is super excited, but we're also making kind of silly mistakes. I recently had an athlete completely forget to drop off his drop bags, which contained his key nutrition for a big long race oh. yeah that's 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 not good but it's you know we're, we're just a bundle of habits right and when we've been you know racing year to year to year and you're kind of like honing your craft so to speak and all of a sudden you have a pandemic where you don't race your habits get off and i think that you know your athletes and, and my athletes and even myself it's like the first few races back it should be expected that there's a few cobwebs to blow off, a little bit of rust to knock off, and you know that that's fine. So a little grace along the way as we uh, settle back into race mode, I think is just fine. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to make mistakes, but to try to help mitigate and limit some of those mistakes, I think today is a great opportunity to talk about what we can do in training to get us ready for those big, like for those big stage moments where all the chips are down and we have to be ready to perform. So one of those big ticket items I see with athletes is if they're going to mess something up, it's, you know, they're, they're well-trained for the event. It's oftentimes going to come down to handling situations out on the race course or messing up their race day nutrition. So I want to dive into specifically training or nutrition for these ultra endurance activities. And in my mind, we're kind of going beyond the, the typical, the half marathon, the marathon we're going, we're going bigger. We're on the bike longer. We're in our running shoes on the trail longer. What does that look like? Say you've got an athlete and they're stepping up in distance this year. They're doing their first, you know, maybe they're in Kansas this weekend doing their first 200 mile gravel race. How do you approach nutrition and nutrition changes for that level of performance with an athlete. Hmm. Well, I'll speak to I'll speak to the cycling and maybe even like triathlon side of things. I have a lot more experience rather than uh, you crazy ultra runners out there, and maybe I can learn a little bit from you uh, when it comes to those hundred mile runs. But uh, you know, Unbound uh, out in Kansas is is a good example for this because it is super long but it also has uh, what I call performance elements to it. Meaning for off-road races, they all, they all start hard, okay? So the first hour is like super hard, way harder than you'd normally go if you're doing a 200 mile or 150 mile race, I mean a hundred mile, let's face it. Um, I have athletes doing the 100 and the 200. I have athletes going for the win. I have athletes just going to finish. And walking through the, the fueling strategies for everybody this week has been super fun. It's a little bit of rinse and repeat because there are some elements that are the same. However, the individual athlete has their own uniqueness in terms of the type of fuel that they're using, uh, the rate of fuel that they're using and things like this. But from a, like a high level standpoint, I look at when those performance aspects are going to come into play from the racing um, element. And then when it, what I mean by the performance elements is like when you're going super hard. Okay. When you're going super hard, you're burning more carbohydrate as a fuel source from muscle glycogen and from your liver. And, uh, you're generally not going to take many things on board. That's going to be hard to digest. So we're talking more liquid and gels and things like this during those, uh, more intense time periods. 
And then in the time periods where it's less intense, you can take on uh, fuel that is a little bit more complex, something that you can chew. We'll get, we'll get into these details a little bit later, but that's where you can put um, um, more interesting fuels uh, into the system over time. And I'm sure we'll talk about some uh, specific parameters in terms of fueling per hour and things like this, but just from a high level, I'm looking at when the athlete needs to burn it hot and go hard and when, when they're not. And that's how I start to shape up fueling strategies for a longer event like that. Yeah. So I think you bring up a really interesting point right there. You say, okay, this is high level. You know, what is the general need for most athletes? And then stressing the individuality of every athlete. Training is very individual. Yeah. Nutrition is incredibly individual. What sits well in your stomach. So say, um, you know, obviously these athletes have been prepping for this event for months now. Um, maybe they've been prepping yeah. since 2019 for all I know it's yeah. been, you know, 2020 being yeah. erases, erases just being, you know, erased off the calendar. Um, yeah. how have you taken, you know, f- to meet those individual needs? What does that look like in training in prep for these races? How can they, are they practicing this on the bike on the weekends or is their training fueling completely different than what they're going to be doing on race day? Hmm. Well, this, this may make me sound like a, like an old school, like jock coach guy kind of thing, but I I used to wrestle. Okay. And this is, man, this even goes back to like high school. So everybody can judge me out there for quoting a high school wrestling coach, but he was a hell of a good coach. And he would scream to us that if you wrestle, if you practice like a dog, you're going to wrestle like a dog. And what he meant by that, and you can think about that because we're like, what? Because we would always be like, and we would quote him, you know, our, our friends would be like, man, and we would say that in the locker room and all this kind of stuff. But what he meant was if you just laid around, if you practice, uh, if you practice weekly, right? If you practice like in a very lazy dog sort of manner, that's how you're going to compete out there. So if you slack off and practice, it's not going to bring your A game for when it's time to compete. And where I apply that to my coaching in the here and now is everything that we do in training leading up to an event is pretty much the same as the day of event, which is why you're, you know, if you're, uh, if you have a coach out there, they oftentimes will say, you know, nothing new on race day, because we want things to be automatic. We want things to be, um, a known factor. And by introducing something, especially a fuel source in, um, that's un you know, unknowable to your stomach as well as to your body, you could have some bad things going on. So I shake all that out in, you know, the, you know, months and weeks leading up to the event. Um, specifically the, the stuff that we can carry for the fuel, um, type. And also I like to plan on stuff that's long like this, or in particular stage racing, which is some of my favorite, um, stuff where you want to be, adaptable to the food that you're going to see out on race course as well. So whether it's, you know, uh, pretzels or M&Ms or uh, in Central America, like in Costa Rica, they have papitas de sol, which is just, you know, uh, little boiled potatoes where you can dunk them in salt and put them in. And so you want your gut to be adaptable to all different fuel sources while kind of hanging your hat on the fuel sources that you can carry and know that's going to sit well. Yeah, I think that's so important to know that they that they have they've tested it. They have shown up time and time again during training to make sure that what they're going to see on race day is going to work, and that allows you to have backup plans, which we can talk about more later. I find it so frustrating when athletes are willing to spend the time, spend the money, spend the resources to get to these events, but they refuse to practice that nutrition, and they can throw their race away because they're not prepared for that. Their gut, which is a trainable organ, is not prepared for the race day demands of eating. I see so many runners who maybe they eat 100 calories an hour on their run, on their training runs. Like they're generally under under fueled. I am guilty of that on many a long run. But then we yep. turn around and expect our stomachs to be able to take in 200, 300 calories an hour on race day. Yep. And there's no way your stomach can be ready for that which I just think it's, it's yeah. so frustrating as a coach. Um, I'm sure you've, you, I'm sure you've never yeah. seen that with any of your athletes. No, never, never. And I've never done it myself either. You know, we're just perfect, perfect people over here. Um, no, 
not so much. Um, but but yeah, you, you bring up the the great point. I mean, the gut is trainable, right? And the, the the athlete needs to consider that as an adaptable and trainable aspect, because um, if you get really good at fueling, say you know you throw out two to three hundred calories per hour, good good starting point. Um, when you start to do that and you're not used to it, it may feel bad. You may have some GI issue and all this kind of stuff. And then you go back to coaching and say, Oh God, I felt like throwing up all this kind of, okay, go do it again. Because the second time, the third time, the fourth time you do it, you'll realize that your body will start to absorb that. And then all of a sudden you start producing better powers, holding better paces and having a better experience out there. And it just becomes more fun which is kind of the end goal for most of us. I would hope so. I hope the end goal is to have, yeah, so. have more fun. Um, I know that <laughs> I'm approached by several athletes, and I, I think this holds true in the cycling side of things um, as well, is that obviously our training rides and runs aren't going to be necessarily as long or close to as long as our ultra endurance events, particularly if you're going like 12 hours plus, right? Like if you're training for cross-country racing or shorter shorter road road stage racing type stuff, you know, you might, you might train longer than you race, but for most of us in this kind of category of distances, we're not hitting those distances on a Saturday ride or a Sunday run or something of that nature. And so I've got athletes that come to me and they say, every time I get past the six hour mark in a race, my stomach falls to pieces every time I get past this point. And it's not like, oh, we can say, okay, well, we're going to go run for, you know, eight hours every weekend and, and get you to that point. So you can practice eating past that point. How do you, how do you deal with that as a coach working with athletes who are going to be racing unknowable distances or unknowable amounts of time when they kind of step out of, you know, these traditional distances? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little, more fortunate to work with athletes in in more cycling and triathlon where we have less pounding over an eight hour time period right than than runners so i can i can go to those durations a little bit more frequently than runners can and you start to shake it out you know in those long sessions at at that point in terms of you know how your body reacts to the long stuff um versus the the short stuff so in in but in that area the first couple times where a rider or an athlete goes up to around six hours. And I'm glad you brought up six hours because that is kind of a magical cutoff point to where the body does start to change because of the the fatigue that's occurring, the exposure of time that you're out there and kind of the, the exponential fatigue that does occur after six hours. For a lot of my athletes, even doing stuff like Leadville and all this kind of stuff, I mean, six, seven hours is gonna be my topping out point for that. Um, for like, I got, I do have one guy doing the unbound XL and we've gone longer and we've blocked it up. I'll talk about that here in a minute, but basically what you're talking about is, um, you're bringing an athlete up to the edge of what they've known before in terms of a fatigue for a, a, you know, concentrated time period. You want to bring them up to there cause you, cause you want to see what happens. And you don't know really what's going to happen and nor do they, because if you bring them up to an edge an edge, meaning they've never been there before, uh, you want to keep to what you know to be true, meaning say fueling at two to 300 calories per hour as you go and also tune into what your body needs. And this is where I call like, it's an emotional palette that we have throughout this long ride or long run, because you're going to have all these cravings. Sometimes you want to feed those cravings. Sometimes you don't because you want to stick to the plan, but also give you, give the body what it needs along the way. And so kind of to answer that question is like, um, bring them up to that edge, have them find out kind of who they are. And if they're craving, you know, if they're craving like some pizza or if they're craving something, you know, crazy, like go for it, just don't eat a ton of it. Right. Keep it to around, you know, probably 400 calories or less for like a feeding type, because, you still need to go, you still need to exercise and move and your body just wants to sit and hang out and absorb those calories, but you need to keep going. And that's where you're going to have some GI issues. Meanwhile, keep on the hydration plan very sequentially. If you need a dinger for a reminder or whatever, because your nutrition, your greatest nutrition plan only works with a great hydration plan. Food absorbs well on a hydrated gut. So you want to stay as hydrated as you can throughout. Don't get too far behind. And, but yet play to that emotional palate over time, meaning calories, calories are king at this point for 
fueling and feeling good for an eight hour day. Yeah, I'm really happy that you brought up hydration there kind of at the end of end of that, because you're right, it, it really is important that if you're, you can't absorb anything, if you're dehydrated, and you're kind of setting yourself back, um, we call it. Um, and this also this happens a lot when we're in extreme, extreme heat and extreme altitude as well, right? Because the blood wants to be anywhere but the stomach it's got other things to do it's got to cool you off it's got to go to those working Mm -hmm. muscles um so you have harder like you've more and more stress on those tissues of your stomach to try to bring anything in so if you add dehydration on top of that you have a really dysfunctional gut and all of a sudden you're gonna suffer the consequences um out one end or the other unfortunately Exactly. Exactly. And I think so, you know, like we'll go deeper on what happens in the ultra like distance sort of scenario, but I think it's super important to revisit like how to, to get to a point where you can eat a slice of pizza at seven hours. Right. Because again, like you want it, your success leading up to that point is all the successes per hour to that point, which is shaken out in training. Like we just talked about and all this kind of stuff. And we keep on throwing out two to 300 calories per hour, but like specifically for people listening I say, here's how I do it. If you start ideally topped off and ready to go, meaning you had breakfast a few hours ago, um, you come in fresh to the event, you're not blowing out all this kind of electrolytes are topped off, all this kind of stuff. And in, in say my world of off-road racing or cycling and triathlon, you, well, triathlon's not there. Off-road racing. Let's take that unbound. You start hard. Everybody's going. I mean, it's dark. You know, there's some lights going on. It's like, oh my God. The last thing that's on your mind is really fueling at that point. So you want to start topped off and ready to go because you really can't fuel like you should in that first hour. But you also don't need to because your liver, your muscles, your blood is topped off and ready to go. Fuel tank is full. After that first hour, things start to stabilize, normalize. Now we're on to our fueling protocol. Okay two to 300 calories per hour, good starting point. But this should be, again, like I said, shaken out in training. I like to look at those, you know, the total calorie count like that and two to 300, good. I would say some people, and and also it can vary as well. You can go down to maybe like, maybe like 120 um, and be okay with that. But there also has to, if you're going to go 120 per hour for a few, there also has to be more like the threes and the 400 calorie per hour to kind of shore that up later on. So on average, let's just call it two. Um, so you want after that first hour, then you're starting with around uh, 200 calories per hour in the form of primary carbohydrate. And also you can, you can drink that or you can eat that in the unbound or off-road races. You start generally with a little bit more liquid because it's harder intensity. So you're going to drink and eat those gels. And then once we get into three hours and four hours, that's when the bars start to happen or little rice cakes and all this kind of stuff. And then it's going to be, you still want uh, at least 20 ounces of fluid coming into the body per hour. And again, you got to mix and match or calculate your calories per hour with sport drink and water coming in, but I just say 20 ounces minimum per hour and 20 to 30 ounces on average in hot and humid environments, you can go up to 40 ounces per hour and still be successful. And I'd say airing on the side of a little bit more, it's definitely not a bad thing in that realm. So 20 to 40 fluid ounces per hour and anywhere down to like 120 to all the way up to uh, probably 400 calories per hour. That's the broad range for people to start with or start at. Okay. Now you do all of that for the first five hours, five or six hours. Okay. You're speaking my language. (laughs) Which is a lot. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But you have to do that super, super well before you can talk about this ultra endurance nutrition topic that we're really going for here. And and, and so for anyone listening here, like, five hours of all that. Oh my God, I haven't even calculated this in my life, let alone like gone to a six hour ride. But yeah, that's what we're talking about. And that's like the crazies out there. That's who we coach. That's what we do. Yeah. We love it. (laughs) We love them. Yeah, for sure. But that's the edge, right? So that's where body potentially starts shutting down, gets a little more emotional. Oh, I want more salty food rather than sweet and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Give it. But you got to keep on your hydration protocol, meaning 20 ounces uh, minimum per hour 
if the if the stomach's feeling a little like uh, bloaty or a little balled up, then give it more pure water. If you're going really good, okay, keep the sport train coming because the carbohydrate and the electrolytes that you want those absorbing as as much as and they're possible. Super and then easy, you can have right? they're super easy to yeah. get in because they're so super simple. Easy. Yep. And if everything's good, stomach's good, and you're craving that slice of pizza, okay, go for it. But just make sure you take bites of it and all this kind of stuff and you know, like, let it be just as like warm hug. And then you keep on going and you keep on going with your protocol um, hour after hour after hour. And that's, that's how I do it. Yeah, that's I mean, and it's one of those things where it's like, when it goes right, it goes right. And when it goes wrong, it can go really, really wrong. And part of that, as you mentioned, like this has to be f- like fleshed out in practice on those long rides I'm thinking back to all my cycling friends who you know they're stopping for pastries or they're stopping for pizza and then they still you know finish their ride out and I'm like okay there's you know it might feel funky in the stomach but that's one way to practice it right I've got runners who they set up their car as their aid station and they do 90 minute loops or two hour loops and they come back to their car and you know on on their run when they're out there in the woods they've got you know gels and their normal their normal hydration product and then at the car it's the aid station food practice. It's the potato chips. It's the Coke. It's the, yeah. you know, M and M's and all that kind of stuff because, you know, that's what you're, that's what you're faced with. I think some people get some decision, not decision fatigue, but they get overwhelmed at an aid station and these big long races too, where it's like, well, I've practiced with this stuff, but now I'm staring down, you know, crazy stuff in aid stations and I'm not sure what I should eat or could eat, and that gets even more out of hand. I feel like traveling internationally for racing, right? And coming up against food that you've never seen before in an aid station and having no idea how it's going to sit in your stomach. Um, so I guess one uh, kind of another question stemming off of that, right, is how do you best prepare athletes to, besides, you know, it sounds like practicing this on these long, on these long rides is how do you prepare them to course correct when they've made a mistake during this race? Maybe they got behind on nutrition or behind on the hydration or something is just a little bit off. It's not going quite right. How do you prep them to course correct from a nutrition and hydration standpoint in the midst of this long ultra event when, you know, emotions are high and you're tired and, you know, your stomach's upset. What, what do you do then? So the two most common things that happen are, um, GI distress, meaning like bloaty, uncomfortable stomach and cramps. So I would say, let's, let's take those two, um, examples and also take the approach that like, we're not necessarily going for the win overall. Um, so meaning from a pacing standpoint, we're not like necessarily pinning it, even though you might've had a good pace going into it. Now you got some GI issue, slow down, drink more pure water. And the reason why I say that is, you know, the harder you go, the more, as Corinne said, the more the blood flow is going to the peripheral muscle to do the effort that your brain is uh, <laughs> trying to make it go. And so if you can slow down and bring some blood back into the stomach and also just drink a little bit more pure water and just like sips at a time, you're going to help rehydrate the gut and you're going to help bring blood to help digest and hopefully calm that situation down. If you've got major GI issue and you roll up to the, you know, aid station, plant the bike or whatever, go to the outhouse, do your thing, come back out and then go slower, drink more pure water, away we go. And that's, that's kind of the go-to for that. It's not a super sexy answer, but, but it's important, honestly, even at the front of ultras, it's like, if you got to slow down for a second to get things under control, to, to thermoregulate better, to get that hydration or nutrition in, that could save you time 20 miles down the road 40 miles down the road as opposed to you know yeah. death marching in and i don't know how you death march on a bike um because gears are involved but in a in running ultras right we can we can death march for a very long time and it's not a pleasant experience yeah death marching is not com- uh, not a great thing uh, but i'll share a quick story about cape epic one year i did this with my athlete and it kind of it, it applies here gi issues for sure but it's it was coming from it's not from my fueling, uh, but what happens there is uh, your body's not used to the bacteria, especially like in the water, okay, South Africa. And uh, this is my first year down there, and it's like 50% of the field gets something, okay? 
and it's in it's the in the water and you just kind of know and accept that there's a few hacks that you can travel with in terms of like a, like a cipro or there's there's better antibiotics strong antibiotics but you don't want to resort to that necessarily anyway had some bacteria going on and I, w- I had like sweat just like i wasn't sleeping i was like sweating profusely like at night and i was just like man i need electrolytes and i need hydration so i was i was drinking as much pickle juice as possible and and uh, electrolyte um uh drink in water but i a couple times i just had to communicate to my teammate i was like hey look just soft pedal i need to go in the woods i'll be right back okay brought some toilet paper with me a few times and i got to the point where i had to it's really dusty there and luckily uh spot gave us a free little neck buff and i ended up having to cut the neck buff in half uh in order to uh do, get rid of a gi uh issue but again you communicate with your teammate away you go and you soldier on you just get through yeah and then but but again it was like i knew that i was losing so much fluid and fluid like we're just you know so watery bags of salt Right. And so I was just trying to consume as much water and salt as possible. Luckily, I, I really enjoy pickle juice. So I was just like, loving, loving it, man. Yeah. Did you, so you're obviously having GI issues during that experience. Yeah. Did you also, did you experience exercise associated muscle cramping with that too? Your cat, your calves uh, yes. freak out, your yes. adductors freak out. Yeah. Um, in that particular one, I can't recall. I probably did. I mean, cause I was just losing so much, but I, I definitely have gotten cramps, you know, in the past. And it's also the other common example. So in that situation, cramps are, they're multifaceted. So it's not just electrolytes. I want people to, to realize that. Okay. And there's a lot of specificity that goes on and the specificity of not only, excuse me, say uh, uh, performance, meaning when you're going hard and fast for long periods of time, and this is where kind of like finding those edges come back in. Typically, when you're cramping um, from a performance aspect, like you're just time trialing your face off or um, or kind of in this performance zone where you've never been before, you'll start to cramp. Okay, happens early season, happens on like, say, hill climb, really long hill climbs where you haven't done that before. Could be back, could be legs, could be adductors, whatever. Um, So what you want to do is, again, comes back to training. You want to keep on finding your edges in training, keep on pushing the boundaries of what you're able to do. Meanwhile, there is an electrolyte and hydration component to it. So it goes back to our fueling per hour. You want 20 to 40 fluid ounces per hour. You want a couple hundred calories per hour. And in particular, we didn't talk about sodium and electrolytes, but sodium is the main driver here. Okay. Uh, 500 milligrams on average per hour is what I recommend. Okay. Plus or minus a few hundred milligrams. And that's going to be really helpful in staving off some of those uh, cramp situations. I also like to use a couple products for preloading for a really hot human environment or a really extreme uh, like performance environment. And a couple products there, uh, the Osmo Preload, super good, as well as scratches, uh, hyperhydration, and all that's going on there. You got a little carbohydrate. And you've got a lot of sodium citrate, sodium chloride, uh, and a few other electrolytes. But again, sodium is a primary driver. It's about 1,500 to 1,700 milligrams of electrolytes that you're pumping into the system. Super salty. To again. Bag of saline. Super salty. Yeah, bag of saline. Exactly. Um, But if you're able to put that into the gut an hour ahead of time on a relaxed stomach, it's then going to (laughs) filtrate into the body and you'll be topped off and ready to go. However, your question, I believe, was in the moment or in the yeah. five hours deep on cramping now what yeah when you've gotten deep so slow down happens? yes exactly slow down i like to find sodium because that's definitely going to help okay and that sodium can be sport drink it can be food like the uh, uh potatoes and salt but pizzas de sol um or kind of what it is salt lick salt tabs people that really is helpful there's another hot uh product on the market i think it's uh, there's like a like a spicy pickle juice thing yeah I it's, can't a, it's the name a of it. trp agonist so that's kind of it, it speaks to the yeah. this is like something that i'm super nerdy about um mm-hmm. as you mentioned which is really important it happens in the mouth yeah as you mentioned um 
cramping in exercise settings is not, it used to be that we thought it was like very much only about electrolytes, but it turns out it's very multifactorial. It's a perfect storm of a lot of things going awry, generally going harder than you're used to. Like you mentioned, like a hill climb much longer on something like that than you're used to. Um, Obviously environmental factors are stressful to the body. And so it's more of a neuromuscular thing that's going on. It's this neuromuscular fatigue. And so there's companies on the market. This is why pickle juice works. Pickle juice isn't necessarily about the electrolytes. It's about the fact that it's the vinegar. And so you have these things um, throughout your mouth and your throat, throughout your body. They help um, tell you that things hurt. They help to tell you if something's cold or hot. And there are products now actually that are designed to trigger those. They're called TRP channels, designed to trigger those locations and basically reset the neuromuscular system to say, okay, we've been, you've been getting the signal contract, contract, contract. We're resetting that. So now you get contract, relax, contract, relax to break that cramping cycle. Um, they've definitely been there. I've, I've used them. I use them at Leadville, um, when I was cramping and they definitely help to abate cramps when they're in process, but I don't think they've been proven to prophylactically prevent cramps from happening. Um, which is, I think, one of the the marketing claims initially. But yeah, if you're if you can handle some cayenne pickle juice, essentially um, mid ride or mid run, because um, you're cramping, it's definitely a nice little thing to keep in your in your bag for emergencies. Okay, so Corinne, you were just talking about the TRP channels, and I wanted to go there as well. I don't understand it nearly as much, but the literature that I was reading even. This was, was this a few years ago now? When like when like it was like a really hot topic that kind of thing. So the TRP channels happen, but it's like this acidic and spice that happens over the mouth, or like what what mechanistically like what is happening in the mouth to do this? Yeah, and or and then up into so the TRP channels, they're um, they're pain receptors and they're temperature receptors, and so they we call them we call things agonists if they can activate that channel Mm -hmm. and so things that are agonists for specific trp channels and they have numbers like trp v8 or v1 um agonists for them are things like cayenne wasabi menthol um there's a bunch of ginger there's a bunch of other things um but so there's a bunch of research that's going to come out about menthol in the coming year i would say probably with the tokyo olympics because akin to your body saying, recognizing cayenne at this channel, if it, it recognizes menthol and it feels, it tells that channel because that channel is associated with cool sensations, cooling sensations, um, recognizing cold. It tells that channel, oh, this is a cool thing. I am feeling cool. And so they're using it in uh, heat settings actually to elicit a, um, a change in perceived not perceived exertion, perceived feeling of the temperature. Um, So you could use it not to thermoregulate, but to elicit a more pleasant experience in the heat, for example. Tingly, tingly results, cool tingly results. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, So yeah, that's, so the practical application here is like, like you said, like pickle juice, right? Um, It has some of those characteristics. There's some, um, you know, engineered products that you can buy out there. I personally have never done that but for years um i have been using and also recommend uh pickle juice and and how to do this is you get like a gel flask that can carry like you know three four five gels whatever and that pickle jar that's in the back of your refrigerator you just take that jar pour some of that juice into your gel flask put that in your back pocket and or have it at a feed station or something like this where you know that you're gonna probably be a little bonky around four or five hours something like this and take a hit of that Take, you know, try it in training, first of all. Yes, practice. Um, see how much you can tolerate. Yeah, exactly. But gosh, in all my long stuff, um, it's it's always there. It's always there. Um, and in particular, so say if you don't have TRP channel inducers. Yeah, transducers. Ag- we call them agonists in the Trans- lit- like in the literature in agonists. the science. Okay. We call them agonists. Okay, TRP agonists. Okay, if you don't have those in your back pocket. What do you do then, um, <laughs> man? You you got to be gritty, and one so one one race in particular. So I I, I uh, what, used to race, and then I just like started coaching, and then didn't race for like 
six or seven years and then I got back to racing, uh, long story short. And so I got myself, uh, peer pressured into this race. I got off the front and we're off the front of the 60 mile road race. Seven miles? I don't know. I was off the front for like ever with one other guy. We we're going, I was feeling good, whatever. And all of a sudden, like, it was just like Adam's level of stoke comes dropping down and the cramps start ratcheting up. And I'm like, oh my God. And I bought you a bottle in the feed and I'm just like running low. I had double electrolyte uh, sport drink going on and I was like trying to get all that I could, but I was just like counting off the miles. And at the end of the day, like I didn't have enough fuel. I wasn't well prepared. It was not a great, like, I, I, I want to say it should have been like a pandemic that botched me off my habits or whatever, but I just had to grit my teeth and bear it and get to that finish line. Guy out sprinted me and I just, I, I like stood up for the sprint, almost locked up and I just <laughs> So it sounds like (laughs) everything that could go wrong in preparation and then in the race itself did, did go wrong. And the only thing that could get you through it is just, you know, grin and bear it in a lot of ways. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm like a two hour champ, you know, uh, like for two hours I'm good, but for a lot of it, that's, this was pre pandemic Adam, by the way, I, I actually did some training and some volume and stuff and now I'm pretty good. Um, for the longer stuff, which is way better because it makes my life like way more fun when I get invited to the long stuff and then you show up and you actually don't die. Um, it's primary goal. But yeah, this was like, I just didn't do my training. Like, so I didn't do my training. And then I also botched, uh, you know, the fuel game. And then I had all the bad things go, go wrong, you know, so it happens to the best of us. Yeah, it does happen to the best of us. But it sounds like, you know, I think the biggest, the big takeaways here, kind of the overarching theme, right, is that practice doesn't necessarily make perfect or permanent but it makes it pretty darn close right it's all that pre-race time that is so crucial and so important and i think if we could stress one thing to the listeners it's you're not figuring this out on race day you're not figuring this out during the race you're figuring this out in the months and all your previous race experiences to have it come together on race day yeah, I'm glad you brought up previous race experiences because that's also important in problem solving when stuff goes sideways out there. And if we're zooming in on the ultra endurance realm of things, um, it's like the more epic events that you do, the more stage racing that you do, the more exposures you get to all the different foods like situations out there and also a bonking situation to where it's like you just you figure out if your body can handle this like kind of gelatinous sugar looking thing at the aid station that like all the locals are eating. So it can't be terrible. So let's just start with like a little bit at first, pretty tasty, but okay. Now I drink more pure water and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so you, you figure out like what your body can tolerate over time. And, and also you're training your body to be adaptable on the fly like that. And I can't, I can't stress that enough in terms of having an adaptable gut and adaptable like mindset between the ears. Yeah. The stuff always goes sideways. Stuff always goes sideways. But practice and experience go a very, very long way in creating a successful, happy, not death march race day experience. 100%. 100%. I could go a death march. I could go death march as well. Unless, unless you had something else to add to that, if you want a death march like example, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm always thrilled to hear. I think all of us have, have. I mean, I hope not everyone who's listening to this has experienced a death march situation, but I am happy to listen to you tell us about your death march situation. Well, I guess I, and we can always, you know, edit this out too. So you know, this is where we can just riff on it, but. I think that people like if you're listening to this podcast and you're like epic curious, if you're still about, listening to this podcast, if you're still listening, that's that's a good point. Um, then you should you should not go out and seek the death marches, but allow them to come to you when they do. And I think it's a pretty good experience to do that because um, you realize that you're not going to die. But when stuff goes sideways, there was a lead bill that I had. It's my first lead bill, and I had like five flats. My bike broke several times. I mean, the seat post was slipped in my fork. Uh, I, it went floppy. And so I had to like just pump it up to be a rigid fork. And, uh, I mean, there's so many bad things going on. I thought it was gonna be sub nine. I ended up being like just over 10 
and like this is back in the day when people like the number of racers like 700 people so it was, it's not like huge anyway uh had everything go wrong um people like had packed up the people that were going to feed me like at twin lakes inbound they had, like packed up and gone because they're like oh pull for days done and <laughs> So I'm like soldiering through. So I had to go like neutral aids, which weren't anything really back then. It was just like Ken Clover and a shotgun, like with some Twinkies or something. And so we're like going back, power line just kicks you in the nuts. And then I come, you know, flying down Coop. He's hanging out. Of at, course he is. Uh, yeah. Coop, what an angel. Uh, he's hanging out at the very last place to like get a bottle. And I'm like, death marching like with gears in a bike but it's like your head's like hanging you're like out of the saddle to like trying to climb yeah. but like you're you know my hip is like locked up and I, I needed some trp inducers or whatever um and so then i see coop and i just like lighten up he's like pulford man i thought i thought you just like threw the towel in <laughs> gives me a bottle and i'm like i like unclipped i like put the bottle in he starts pushing me i'm like oh my god and i just didn't want to go yeah, but yet it, he's like, he put the bottle in. He, I think he shoved some like food in my pocket because I couldn't like think at that point, right? But he knew exactly what I needed to do, which is like calories and keep yeah. going, right? And through that whole process, I learned not to hit my microphone. And throughout the whole process, I learned how my body like responded and, and reacts when everything goes sideways, like mentally, physically. And then what I needed to do, which was, eat, drink, and keep moving forward if you want to finish. Yeah. And it's, it's as simple it's, as that. It is as simple as that. And I think people get stressed when they hear that they need to slow down, that they need to eat and drink. It's the last thing they want to do. But, and I'm saying, you know, chairs at aid stations and ultras are like very tempting. You sit down in a chair, you might not get back up. But if you need to take five minutes or 10 minutes right then and there to get that fuel in because you're looking at 40 more miles, it's probably worth it. It could probably save your race later on. I mean, or get you back into a place where, you know, you're actually, you're moving again. Um, so I think people write themselves off early when things go awry, but you can troubleshoot even near the front of these races. You can troubleshoot and get yourself back into a much happier position by taking five, slowing down, getting cool if it's too hot, walking if you're at altitude and you need to get some fuel and I definitely stopped at the top of Hope Pass to eat an oatmeal cream pie during Leadville because I couldn't run and eat anymore or at, at least at that altitude so I stopped at the top of Hope Pass had an oatmeal cream pie and then ran down the other side and it was great um so you need to take that time to get that fuel in um because it's gonna I don't know I think it pays dividends at the back end of things um so practice experience Carbs are king. Learn your body. Practice it during training. Is there anything else that our listeners need to know when it comes to eating and drinking for these for these super super long events? No, I think I think you summarized and wrapped it up pretty good there. And it's and it's a matter of like you said, flushing it out in your training, but then also like sticking to that protocol, like hour after hour and being religious about it because you're not always going to want to do it. And that sport drink that you've been nipping on all day doesn't really taste great at hour six, but it is still what you need to put in the system. So like trust it because it's worked in the past. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to feel your body to do the thing that you signed up for that you consider fun. So, Supposedly. you know, just, so just smile, eat, drink, and keep moving forward. Awesome. Well, I know we could deep dive on any tiny facet of this for forever and ever. Um, but I think we'll wrap it up there for today. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast You're very welcome. and yeah, sharing fun. your wisdom with all of us. Love it. Yeah. <laughs>